Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Friday, August the 28th. Today is the commemoration of St. Augustine of Hippo, pastor and theologian. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ships of Tarshish. And we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. Our New Testament reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children. Widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and your, you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. About St. Augustine of Hippo. Augustine was one of the greatest of the Latin Church Fathers and a significant influence in the formation of Western Christianity, including Lutheranism. Born in A.D. 354 in North Africa, Augustine's life, early life was distinguished by exceptional advancement as a teacher of rhetoric. In his book Confessions, he describes his life before his conversion to Christianity, when he was drawn into the moral laxity of the day and fathered an illegitimate son. Through the devotion of his sainted mother Monica and the preaching of Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, Augustine was converted to the Christian faith. During the great Pelagian controversies of the 5th century, Augustine emphasized the unilateral grace of God in salvation of mankind. 
bishop and theologian at Hippo in North Africa from A.D. 395 until his death in A.D. 430, Augustine was a man of great intelligence, a fierce defender of the Orthodox faith, and a prolific writer. In addition to confessions, Augustine's book City of God had a great impact upon the Church throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And I added this uh, in morning prayer this morning, I'll repeat it here. Uh, Martin Luther was significantly uh, inspired and uh, by St. Augustine's writings, and in fact Luther was an Augustinian monk when he took his holy orders. Uh, so it was St. Augustine who uh, more or less wrote the, uh, I don't know what you would call it, the, uh, the rules for, for their uh, monastery, the way they uh, chose to live an ascetic life, was written by him. So Luther was very, very familiar with his work. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is, since I didn't do evening prayer last night, tonight we are starting Article 5 of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, beginning in Paragraph 1, Article 5 on Love and Fulfilling the Law. This is the longest article in the Apology. So we'll be talking about sanctification, good works, and things like that. Article 5, Love and Fulfilling the Law. On this topic, the adversaries quote against us, If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Likewise, it is the doers of the law who will be justified, and many other things about the law and works. Before we reply to this, we must first declare what we believe about love in the fulfilling of the law. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. Jeremiah 31.33 Do we overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Romans 3.31 if you would enter life, keep the commandments, Matthew 19.17. But if I have not love, I gain nothing, 1 Corinthians 13.3. These and similar sentences testify that we are to keep the law when we have been justified by faith and so grow in fulfilling the law more and more by the Spirit. Furthermore, we are not talking about ceremonies, but about the law that addresses the movements of the heart, namely the Ten Commandments. Faith brings the Holy Spirit and produces a new life in hearts. It must also produce spiritual movements in hearts. The prophet Jeremiah shows what these movements are when he says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. Therefore, when we have been justified by faith and regenerated, we begin to fear and love God, to pray to him, to expect aid from him, to give thanks and praise him, and to obey him in times of suffering. We also begin to love our neighbors, because our hearts have spiritual and holy movements. These things cannot happen until we have been justified through faith and regenerated. We receive the Holy Spirit. First, because the law cannot be kept without Christ, likewise the law cannot be kept without the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is received through faith, as Paul declares in Galatians 3.14, that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Also remember, how can the human heart love God while it knows that he is terribly angry and is oppressing us with earthly and endless distress? The law always accuses us. It always shows that God is angry. God is not loved until we receive mercy through faith. Not until then does he become someone we can love. Civil works, i.e. the outward works of the law, can be done in some measure without Christ and without the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, from what we have said, it seems that what belongs only to the divine law, i.e. the heart's affections toward God, which are commanded in the first table, cannot be done without the Holy Spirit. But our adversaries are fine theologians. They focus on the second table and political works. They don't care about the first table. They act as though the first table were of no matter. They certainly require only outward fulfillment of the law. They in no way consider the law that is eternal and placed far above the sense and intellect of all creatures. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Christ was given for this purpose that forgiveness of sins might be bestowed on us for his sake. He was also given so that the Holy Spirit might bring forth in us new and eternal life and eternal righteousness. Therefore, the law cannot truly be kept unless the Holy Spirit is received through faith. So Paul says that the law is established through faith and not made useless, because the law can only be kept when the Holy Spirit is given. Paul teaches the veil that covered the face of Moses cannot be removed except by faith in Christ, by which the Holy Spirit is received. See 2 Corinthians 3.14-18. 
For he says, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 2 Corinthians 3, 15 and set through 17. Paul understands by the veil, the human opinion about the entire law, the Ten Commandments, and the ceremonies. In other words, hypocrites think that outward and civil works satisfy God's law, and that sacrifices and observances justify a person before God by the outward act, ex opera operato. But then this veil is removed from us, i.e. we are freed from this error, when God shows to our hearts our uncleanness and the hatefulness of sin. Then for the first time we see that we are far from fulfilling the law. We learn to know how flesh is self-secure and doesn't care. It does not fear God and is not completely certain that we are cared for by God. It imagines that people are born and die by chance. Then we experience that we, experience that we do not believe that God forgives and hears us. But when we hear about the gospel and the forgiveness of sins, we are consoled through faith. We receive the Holy Spirit so that now we are able to think correctly about God, to fear and believe God, and so on. From these facts, it is clear that the law cannot be kept without Christ and the Holy Spirit. We profess that the work of the law must be begun in us and that it must be kept continually more and more. At the same time, we also speak about both spiritual movements and outward good works. Therefore, the adversaries falsely charge that our theologians do not teach good works. They not only require good works, but they also show how they can be done. The result convicts the hypocrites, who by their own powers try to fulfill the law. For they cannot do the things they attempt. Human nature is far too weak to resist the devil by its own powers. He holds as captive everyone who has not been freed through faith. There is need for Christ's power against the devil. For we know that Christ, for Christ's sake we are heard and have the promise. We may pray for the governance and defense of the Holy Spirit that we may neither be deceived in error nor be pushed to do anything against God's will. Psalm 68.18 teaches this very thing. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men. Christ has overcome the devil and has been given to us the promise and the Holy Spirit in order that by divine aid, we ourselves may also overcome. So 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Again, we teach not only how the law can be kept, but also how God is pleased if anything is done. This is not because we satisfy the law, but because we are in Christ, as we shall explain shortly. Therefore, it is clear that we require good works. In fact, we also say this, our love for God, even though it is small, cannot possibly be separated from faith. For we come to the Father through Christ. When forgiveness of sins has been received, then we are truly certain that we have a God, Exodus 23. That is, that God cares for us. We call upon him, we give him thanks, we fear him, we love him, as 1 John 4.19 teaches, we love because he first loved us. In other words, we love him because he gave his son for us and forgave us our sins. In this way, John shows that faith comes first and love follows. Likewise, the faith of which we speak exists in repentance. I mean that faith is conceived in the terrors of conscience, which feels God's wrath against our sins and seeks forgiveness of sins, seeks to be freed from sin. In such terrors and other troubles, this faith ought to grow and be strengthened. Therefore, it cannot exist in people who live by the flesh, who are delighted by their own lusts and obey them. So Paul says in Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So too, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Paul is writing about faith that receives forgiveness of sins in a terrified heart and flees from sin. Such faith does not remain in those who obey their desires, neither does it dwell with mortal sin. From these effects of faith, the adversaries select one, namely love, and teach that love justifies. It is clear that they only teach the law. They do not teach that forgiveness of sins is first received through faith. They do not teach about Christ as mediator, that we have a gracious God for Christ's sake, but for the sake of our love. Yet, they do not say what the nature of this love is, neither can they say. They proclaim that they fulfill the law, although this glory belongs to Christ alone. They set up confidence in their own works against God's judgment. 
for they say that they merit according to righteousness, de condingo, grace and eternal life. This confidence is absolutely ungodly and useless, for in this life we cannot satisfy the law because the sinful nature does not stop bringing forth evil inclination and desire, even though the spirit in us resists them. But someone may say, since we also confess that love is a work of the Holy Spirit, and since it is righteousness, because it is the fulfilling of the law, why do we not teach that love justifies? To this we must reply. In the first place, it is certain that we do not receive forgiveness of sins through our love or for the sake of our love, but for Christ's sake, by faith alone. Faith alone looks upon the promise. It knows that because of the promise, it is absolutely certain that God forgives, because Christ has not died in vain. Such faith overcomes the terrors of sin and death. If anyone doubts whether sins are forgiven him, he dishonors Christ. For he judges that his sin is greater or more effective than Christ's death and promise, even though Paul says, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. This means that mercy is more comprehensive than sin. If anyone thinks that he receives forgiveness of sins because he loves, he dishonors Christ and will discover in God's judgment that this confidence in his own righteousness is wicked and useless. Likewise, it is necessary that faith alone reconciles and justifies. We do not receive forgiveness of sins through other powers of the law or because of these, patience, chastity, obedience toward magistrates, and so on. Nevertheless, these virtues ought to follow faith. Likewise, we do not receive forgiveness of sins because of love for God, even though this must follow. Besides, this way of speaking is well known. At times, we use a word for something, and we use the same word for the cause and the effects of that thing, synecdoche. For example, in Luke 7.47, Christ says, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Christ himself interprets this when he adds, Your faith has saved you. Christ did not mean that the woman had merited forgiveness of sins by that work of love. This is why he adds, Your faith has saved you. But faith is that which freely obtains God's mercy because of God's word. If anyone denies that this is faith, he does not understand at all what faith is. The story in this passage shows what Christ calls love. The woman came with the opinion that forgiveness of sins should be sought in Christ. This worship is the highest worship of Christ. She could think nothing greater about Christ. To seek forgiveness of sins from him was truly to acknowledge the Messiah. To think of Christ this way, to worship him this way, to embrace him this way, is truly to believe. Furthermore, Christ used the word love not toward the woman, but against the Pharisee. He contrasted the entire worship of the Pharisee with the entire worship offered by the woman. He rebuked the Pharisee because he did not acknowledge that he was the Messiah, even though he performed the outward duties that a guest and a great and holy man deserved. Christ points to the woman and praises her worship, ointment, tears, and so forth. These were all signs of faith and a confession. With Christ, she sought forgiveness of sins. It is indeed a great example. Not without reason, this moved Christ to rebuke the Pharisee, who was a wise and honorable man, but not a believer. He charges him with lack of holiness and admonishes him by the example of this woman. In this way, Christ shows that it is disgraceful for the Pharisee, while an unlearned woman believes God, he, a doctor of the law, does not believe. He does not acknowledge the Messiah and does not seek from him forgiveness of sins and salvation. So Christ praises her entire worship. This often happens in the scriptures, that by one word we embrace many things. Below we shall speak at greater length about similar passages, such as Luke 11.41, But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. He requires not only alms, but also the righteousness of faith. He says here, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. This means that she had truly worshipped me with faith and faith's exercises and signs. He means the entire worship. Meanwhile, he teaches this, forgiveness of sins is properly received by faith, even though love, confession, and other good fruit ought to follow. He does not mean that these fruit are the price, or are the atonement that reconciles us to God because of which the forgiveness of sins is given. We are disputing about a great subject, about Christ's honor, and where good minds may seek for sure and firm consolation. We are disputing whether confidence is to be placed in Christ or in our works. If it is to be placed in our works, the honor of mediator and atoning sacrifice will be withdrawn from Christ. 
Yet we shall find in God's judgment that this confidence is useless. From this confidence, consciences rush directly into despair. If forgiveness of sins and reconciliation do not happen freely for Christ's sake, but for the sake of our love, no one will have forgiveness of sins. He would only have it when he had fulfilled the entire law, because the law does not justify as long as it can accuse us. Therefore it is clear that we are justified through faith, since justification is reconciliation for Christ's sake. For it is very certain that forgiveness of sins is received through faith alone. And Monday evening we will go on to the next section called, No One Can Keep the Law Perfectly. Now we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And as always on Fridays, our Friday prayer focuses on Christ's passion. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth, and there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds, you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin you were counted a sinner and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit so that you could pay our debt and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain, we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. O Lord God, the light of the minds know that you, the life of the souls that love you, and the strength of the hearts that serve you. Give us strength to follow the example of your servant Augustine of Hippo, so that knowing you, we may truly love you, and loving you, we may fully serve you. For to serve you is perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you in the Holy Spirit is one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.